Hey Grace Chapel, my name is Michael Rice and uh, thanks for tuning in for this episode of Ironman. Uh, we're so excited to have you here. Ironman is our men's ministry and exists to equip men to love God and live for His glory. And so uh, we're super excited for all that's happening. I uh, do want you to know that we have Ironman in person on Wednesday mornings at 9 a.m. as well as Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. So we'd love to see you there in person, uh, but we hope you enjoy the word. Thanks. Um, you guys have, uh, many of you been here throughout our, our five weeks that we've been in this series. I'm also really excited to kick off next week. Um, we're going to do uh, a series called Christ's Glorious Achievements. Uh, which is a little takeoff of a, a sermon series that Charles Spurgeon actually taught. Um, so I'm pretty excited about, about that. Um, should be pretty fun. But um, if you haven't been here, or may, if maybe you've uh, uh, missed a few of our, our weeks together, uh, the past few weeks, we've been going through a series called Holy Passions and how our passions are to be conformed to Christ's passion, right? The things that he's passionate about. And s- specifically the series has focused on sexual purity as we are called to be men uh, who are children of God who live in sexual purity um, and obviously uh, exercise the gift of sex within the biblical parameters for it. And so um, it's been a great time going through it. We've, we've learned and talked about of how uh, re- really God is the designer and creator of sex. There is a, uh, a model for it. It is a good thing. God is glorified by it uh, within the right context. Pastor Chris then came and taught uh, for us of how our identity in Christ and who we are uh, as a child of God uh, affects and even empowers our pursuit of sexual purity in our life. Um, Jeremy then came and talked a little bit about cultivating a a satisfying marriage and a healthy marriage, what that looks like, how to be a servant to your spouse, um, and how that also uh, affects our our pursuit of purity in our lives. And then my dad most recently last week spoke to us on uh, how we might establish hedges and establish safeguards within our life so that we will avoid certain uh, pitfalls of sin, um, sexual sin within our lives. Well, today I'm finishing up the series by uh, speaking to us on God's grace for failure, right? Because I, I look at you all and I, as a fellow man myself, I know that there's failure in this regard, right? Uh, we have sinned sexually uh, as, as men who are... Uh, on the road to loving Jesus and pursuing him. And yet there's, there's traps along the way. Uh, we are fallen, right? And we're still dealing with the desires of the flesh. And so, um, we, we mess up, right? And I realize that. Um, and the question then becomes now what, right? What, what do I do now when I've messed up or, or maybe, um, I have in the past, far past, distant past, or, or near, near past, right? Maybe I've messed up. How do I deal with that? Um, and so today, I, I really want to tell you that our message is a very hopeful message, uh, because if you have lived a life that is uh, bound to sin, as we all have, because in one degree or another, we have experienced sin's bondage, uh, we know that the uh, that bondage to sin and a slaving, enslaving effects of it are, are horrible, right? And they wreak havoc upon our lives. And yet, uh, I will say that God's grace is sufficient for us. There is redemption from sin in our lives. And even Christ promises that he can and will redeem us from sin, even sexual sin. And so uh, I want to encourage you, gentlemen, right? There is hope found in Christ. Um, that sexual sin can be beaten, right? Um, and, and maybe that looks differently for you guys as older gentlemen than it does for me and Jaden over here and Joseph's probably in here somewhere as younger gentlemen, right? But nonetheless, there's still sexual sin in, uh, available in our lives, right? And so I want to encourage you that in Christ there is solution. And yet I also want to tell you 
that today, while it is an encouraging message, it is also a hard message, right? Because in the pursuit of holiness, God calls us to do things that are very hard, right? And we're going to talk today about confession and repentance, which is very hard, gentlemen. It is very hard to do. And, and so I, I just want to say at the outset, I want to communicate with grace and kindness, kindness and tenderness of, ha- of, of heart. Excuse me. Um, I want to do that. Um, and I am speaking as one who's had to walk through these steps myself. Okay. Um, so I, I want you to know I, I'm no stranger to, to what we're going to talk about tonight. Right. Um, but I've seen the effect and impact on my life and it's a good thing. And so, um, I want to encourage you that, but even as we get started, I want to ask you a question. How do you, even now, as you're sitting here, view sin in your life? How do you view your sin? What does it look like for you? Is sin something that you are willing to be done with? Is sin something that you have come to hate? Or do you still in your heart harbor a love for it, right? Maybe it's deep down, but maybe do you still have a love for sin and an unwillingness to give it to Christ, right? That's a question that we're going to have to ask tonight and, or today, this morning. I I wrote my notes and it all says tonight because I'm, uh, right? Because I'll preach it again tonight. Right? Gentlemen, uh, let's just ask this question, whether it's sexual sin or otherwise, because everything we're going to talk about, talk about today applies to just sin generally. Are you willing to see the power of sin in your life broken? Do you want that? Well, I think that comes through confession and repentance. In fact, I think that is the model of godly sorrow what godly sorrow looks like. And and, and I would even say that confession and repentance are necessities. We cannot avoid them. We cannot bypass them. If we are to experience success from sin in our life, we must walk down the road of confession and repentance. You see, godly sorrow calls us to die to ourselves, right? And confession and repentance are the means by which God calls us to die to ourselves, because it is hard. It, everything about it in our life screams against it, right? It is self-mortifying. In fact, I would believe that it's the only way to mortify sin. The means that God has provided for us to have victory over sin is by, in fact, dying, dying to ourself. Uh, and truthfully, gentlemen, I think, you know, I, I have conversations and um, even just I was sitting at, at my table a couple weeks ago in the nighttime group. And uh, there was a gentleman who there asked, you know, we always talk about purity, but it seems like nothing ever happens. It seems like we always still struggle with purity. Right. And maybe a little bit of hopelessness in the pursuit of purity. I, I think maybe, gentlemen. I think maybe that's the reason why we're not successful in killing sin, specifically sexual sin, is because we're too busy toying at it rather than killing it, right? There is no more violent action to be taken against sexual sin than the action of confession and repentance. That is the most violent action against sexual sin. And I think God calls us to walk in it. And so how do I break this? This power, when power seems stronger than you, I believe confession and repentance are the means. They are the true test of mortifying our flesh. And also, I will tell you that I believe today that we avail ourselves to victory and freedom in Christ from sins, sexual or otherwise, when we walk down this road of confession and repentance. And the degree to which we follow the biblical picture of confession and repentance and the degree to which we are faithful to that call is the degree that we will experience victory over sexual sin. And so let's start then. The first is God's grace through confession, right? Um, You guys have been around the block a few times more than I have. What's confession? Confession. 
Admission, okay, that's part of it, right? What else? Open your hearts to God. Open your hearts to God, okay, yeah. Identification, Identification, right? You're identifying yourself, you're admitting, you know, who you are and admitting the sin, right? Totally. You know, the the, uh, biblical word for confession literally translated from, from the Greek literally means to say the same thing, right? That's what confession is. It, is. it is an agreeing with God about various things. First off, it's, a, it's agreeing with God in a right view of sin, right? Identifying sin for what it is. Calling sin, sin. Calling righteousness, righteousness. And the reality is we live in a world that calls evil good and good evil, right? So as godly men... Confession begins when we start to see sin for what it is and acknowledge it for what it is. There is built into that then a turning from sin. But it's not just a right view of sin. There is also a right view of God, right? That when we look at our sins, we acknowledge God is holy. His hatred towards sin is just and right. And we... While we have a right view of God that he is holy, we realize that we are not holy as we should be, right? So there's a right view of sin, there's a right view of God, and then there's a right view of self. That we are gentlemen who are desperately depraved in our hearts and mind. We need Christ, we need his intervention, and we need his help, right? And so we, that, that's the realization that we have to come to when we confess, right? And it leads in our hearts to a brokenness, a brokenness of heart, a brokenness of pride that would cause us to run to Christ and run to the cross because we see our sin as an offense against a holy God. But not just an offense against God, because the reality is, is when we sin, we don't just sin against God, we sin against others as well, right? And so then confession has feet to it. There's action that's involved. And and that is when we go and, uh, like Mike said, admit, right? We bring our sins before offended parties and confess to those sins. So when we sin, we certainly confess to God, right? Who is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, right? 1 John 1, 9 talks about that. But the reality is, is when we sin... We don't just sin against God, we sin against others and are therefore then responsible to go and confess to all parties whom we have offended by our sin. That is the biblical model of confession. I I think of even James 5, 16, where James says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. Jesus himself said, So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go first and be reconciled to your brother and then come offer your gift. What is Jesus saying? The practical understanding of this is that if we have a disruption in our horizontal relationships with each other, it will affect our vertical relationship with God such that we will never be able to worship God, have a good relationship with him, live in peace with him, if in fact we have unconfessed sin in our lives that we have not dealt with and confessed to the offended parties. Why is this important? And how does this relate to our topic? Gentlemen, here's here's where this is really hard. And I I told you at the beginning, this is an encouraging message, but it's very hard. Gentlemen, sexual sin is a sin against your wife. And as such needs to be confessed to her. As well as others who will keep you accountable. This is where the act of mortifying your flesh starts to happen. Because you start to see sin for what it is. You see its effects upon not just yourself, but upon others. And you grow to hate it when you have to confess it. You literally bring it into the light. Mm 
Sin thrives in the darkness. And, and I will tell you guys, if we fail to do this, it will disrupt our relationship with God. It will make it such that sin will continue in our lives to thrive rather than die. You have to pull it out from the roots. That's hard. And when I confess, confession is not penance, right? I'm not trying to atone for my sin or gain a right standing before God simply by walking through confession. That would be to add to the work of Christ, which then takes away from the work of Christ. If you add to Christ, you subtract from his glory. At the same time, confession is not unburdening your own heart to simply lay a burden upon another's heart. Lastly, I would say confession is not vague, and yet at the same time, it's not exhaustive. But when we walk in confession, we have to be specific about our confession, right? Now, I have a six-year-old and a four-year-old and a four-month-old. The four-month-old, he never has to confess anything because he's perfect, right? <laughs> Although I know you're saying from uh, Bodhi Bauckham that they're vipers in diapers, right? Oh, yeah. Right? So it's coming. <laughs> but when my children confess, I have to teach them to say sorry. And don't just say, I'm sorry. Say, I'm sorry for X, Y, and Z, right? So when we then walk through confession for sexual sins in our lives, we have to be specific yet not exhaustive. I think we can be exhaustive in, and uh, become overburdening, uh, lay a burden that's too hard for some to hear. But yet we do need to be specific and we need to confess against those whom we have sinned against. And this includes sexual sins. God gives us some promises, though, through confession, which are uh, tremendously encouraging. The first is 1 John 1, 9, if you know the passage, and I even quoted it already. If we confess our sins, he, being God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That he promises to cleanse us to wipe away sin from our lives. I, I believe that's not simply talking about positionally we stand before him as holy and righteous as justification happens. But I think this is also talking about sanctification, that through the act of confessing, when we offer up our sins before the Lord, he actually cleanses sin from our life. It is one of the means by which God kills sin in our lives. I would also say Proverbs 28, 13, which I believe is on the top of your handout. Whoever conceals his transgressions, notice this, will not prosper. So if we hold sin in our life and never deal with it, we are bound to fail. Both in this life and before God. But it says, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Mercy both from God as well as from others. Now, gentlemen, is that not something that you would want in your life? Whether it's sexual sins or otherwise, or other sins, right? We want mercy Maybe it's as simple as an argument with your spouse, right? And harboring hateful feelings, right? Or feelings of resentment because of some past wrong. Bring that before her. Say, I'm sorry. I felt this way. I've sinned against you. Forgive me. I'm bringing this before God as well. I want to walk in unity with you. That is the biblical picture of confession. And I would say that just because we're forgiven at the cross of Christ does not mean that we are not also commanded to confess our sins. There's a reason why scripture commands, confess your sins. If we fail to do that, I would say that sin still maintains a foothold in our life. So then the encouragement that I want to give you in this first point is to bring sin out into the light. Light. 
Luke chapter 12, verse 2, Jesus says, Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be made known. Do you guys realize that about your life? That when we sin and hide skeletons in our closet, all of those skeletons will be revealed, whether in this life or in the next. I think of Paul in Ephesians 5, who says, take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, right? And that is a call to expose not just the sins of others, but our own sins, to literally not let them be hidden behind a veil, if you were. And I would say that the power of secret sin is destroyed in our life when we expose it, when we shine the light on it. J.C. Ryle said, a small leak will sink a great ship and a small spark will kindle a great fire and a little allowed sin in the same way will ruin a never dying soul. What that means is we can't allow sin in our lives and so we have to then confess it, all of it, expose it and be done with it. David talked about the reality in his life when he had hidden sin, when he didn't expose his sin to God. And he says in Psalm 32, verses 1 through 5, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. He's saying, blessed are the ones who are forgiven, right? Jesus says, if you confess your sins, I will forgive you. Right? And yet, David said, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. In other words, the unconfessed sin in his life wasted his body away through groaning as his heart groaned because of it. I I do believe that we can actually experience sickness because of sin, right? James chapter 5 talks about that, as well as other passages. I think this is one. Unresolved sin in our life can cause sickness, disease, and illness. And David here is here saying there was a time in his life when he kept silent and didn't bring his sin before the Lord, and it was affecting him physically even. He says, For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as the heat of summer. Then notice this, I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave me the iniquity of my sin. So there was a burden that even David experienced when he had hidden sin in his life. What do we take from all this? We need to expose sin. And I would say, gentlemen, if there are areas of sin in your life, wouldn't it be best to let it come to light on your own terms rather than being found out in sin, or rather than having your dirty laundry aired out for the first time on Judgment Day. Right? I mean, that Proverbs 28 passage on the top of your handout, when we confess our sins, there is mercy. God gives us mercy, and He forgives us. There is great grace in confessing a sin rather than being found out in a sin. And maybe you're listening to me and going, man, Michael, you want me to go and confess my sins to my wife. Gentlemen, I I will tell you that attaining Christ and forgiveness for your sins before him is better than the 10,000 reasons that you may be telling yourself why you shouldn't confess. You may say, I'm scared. Gentlemen, I, I will tell you, I understand because I've had to walk through this in my own life. I've had to do the very things I'm telling you. And I understand how hard it is. But this is how we come to hate sin. This is how we come to kill it in our lives. I understand that there may even be a reality of a whole host of unforeseen potentials that may come from the act of confession. Scary things, scary consequences 
that may come when we confess our sins. I also know, though, that God is good, he is faithful, and he is kind. He promises that he will never leave us nor forsake us. He will walk through whatever dark days lay ahead of us that may come as a consequence of the choice of honest confession. And he will care for us when no one else will. Because that is his nature. That is who he is. Gentlemen, I'll just tell you this. And this is a realization that I had to come to in my life, which has tremendously benefited and blessed my life. And yet it was so hard. This is so hard. We cannot be scared of the consequences of obedience in our lives. You cannot be scared of that. You have to leave it to the Lord. You have to say, God, I need to trust you. I need to give this to you. The reality, gentlemen, is that what our families need is not perfectly faithful Pharisees, but rather men who are poor in spirit, mourning and hungering and thirsting for righteousness. That is what our families need. Maybe you might say, I still don't think I need to do that. Maybe if I never look at porn again, or never have adultery again, or never flirt with that woman again, or never lust with my eyes again. Well, gentlemen, even then, still you're living a lie. If we never walk through true biblical confession and repentance, sin is deceptive. It will remain in our hearts. It will live in the dark if we don't expose it, and it will even mutate into all different forms in our lives. If in your heart there is an unwillingness to do one of the fundamental things that constitutes the true nature of repentance, and that is confession, if there's an unwillingness to walk in confession in our lives, then I would ask the question, are we ever then really truly repentant over sin? And if we are not repentant over sin, then what does it say about our souls? Confess. That's what I would say. And this is not a one-time thing. This is a lifetime pattern, right? Confess also to one another. There is accountability here in this room. I would say this, if your brother comes and confesses to you, do not be punitive towards repentant people, right? Encourage them, love them, build them up, walk with your brother. Sin creates great sorrow in our lives when we are truly repentant for it. And so what your brother needs is a hug and he needs to be built up. Bear his burdens. Show him mercy. I have listed there for you, and I'm going to let you go over it on your own time, the seven A's of biblical confession. That is a pattern of true confession. I want to look at the, our next point, God's grace for repentance, because confession must be followed by repentance. If I confess and yet don't amend or change my actions, then the confession itself is revealed to be a fraud, right? So we don't just stop at confession, but confession is validated by action. We must move to repentance, which then means we have to define what, what is repentance as well. Repentance then is a changing of not just one's mind, but also one's action. That I don't just think about sin in a certain way, but then I turn from sin. Repentance first is a turning from sin. It is a Change in course. Jesus said, go and sin no more. He said it multiple times. That is the character of the repentant heart. It is someone who was once traveling in a sin-bound direction and yet then turns their lives to pursue something else, something more worthy. Uh, it reminds me of even Zacchaeus who restored what he had extorted from others that even in repentance, there is a willingness to make restitution 
for wrongs committed. And gentlemen, in the, in the process of our confession, we may have to make amends through restitution. And we can't make demands of our wives or others. Matthew Henry, he said, many mourn over their sin who do not truly repent of them. So the reality is, is repentance has to do more with action than it does emotion. There is emotion involved, but it has to do with action. We don't just turn from sin, but we then turn to God. True repentance, when it is in our life, sows an undeniable desire in the heart to proactively seek righteousness and to do what is good. When we have repentance in our life, we desire righteousness. And so then it's transformative and it leads to permanent change in our life. The heart with which we repent is a heart of true godly sorrow. Do you guys remember the Pharisee and the tax collector and how they went to the temple and the Pharisee prayed, thank God I'm not like that scum of the earth, right? That's what he was thinking. But yet, how did the tax collector pray? He beat his breast. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That is the heart that is behind all true repentance. It is a heart of contrition to be contrite. Isaiah 66 talks about this, that God promises he will look upon the one who is humble and contrite of heart and trembles at the word. To be contrite is to have genuine sorrow for sin. It is a weakness, right? A weakness of the heart and humility. And I would say that confession, true confession, and true repentance are a package deal. They come together. One leads to the next. You can't have one without the other. Repentance validates confession to be true. Because when I confess and then I change my action, it, sh it proves that my confession is real and not a fraud. But at the same time, repentance without confession is no repentance at all. What that means, gentlemen, is, is we cannot simply repent from sin and never confess it and still keep it in the dark because that is the opposite of repentance. Repentance leads to confession. So I, I would say this. If, in fact, there is sexual sin in your life or other sin, this extends to all things, and you want to repent of it, you must confess it and follow that up by action. That is the biblical picture of repentance and confession. And repentance is necessary. I will tell you, and you may think I'm teaching workspace salvation right now, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain it. Repentance is necessary for salvation. Jesus preached it. From that time on, Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The apostles preached it. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer on the third day and rise from the dead, that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. Acts 17, verse 30, Paul also said, the time of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people to repent everywhere. Repentance is necessary for salvation. And you could ask devil's advocate, Michael, aren't you preaching works-based salvation? And I'll say no, because confession and repentance are essential, non-negotiable components of saving faith. Not as a work upon which salvation rests in our life. In other words, I'm not saved because I confess and repent, but rather repentance and confession are an accompanying byproduct of true salvation. What that means is true salvation leads to confession and repentance, meaning that if there is a lack of true confession and repentance in my life, then I need to evaluate my salvation, whether or not it is actually real. 
Peter says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So repentance, I would say, is necessary not just for salvation, but also I would say it is necessary for progress. For progress in our fight against sin. Keith Lambert said, until God is your chief concern, until sinning against him is what makes your heart break, you will never turn the corner. So if we're seeking progress in this fight against sexual sin, we must have repentance. It leads to inevitable spiritual progress. And not just that, but it leads to life. Acts 11 verse 18 talks about that God granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. So when we expose our sins through confession and true, genuine repentance, turning from sin, it actually not just gives God's grace and mercy upon our life, his loving kindness and favor, but it leads to life. That's what it does. And we are to approach this process with a heart of genuine sorrow, deep humility for the wrongs that we have committed. You see, the act of confession and repentance is not focused upon what others have done or not done that may have led us into a pattern of sin, but instead it is focused upon me. So when I confess for wrongs in my life, I can't say, but you know, wife, you did this or you didn't do this, which caused me to then do this. That is not true, genuine confession and repentance. Instead, it is focused upon myself as one who is poor in spirit, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, mourning for sin in my life as I bring it before God and I bring it before those whom I have sinned against with a broken and contrite heart. That is what David said in Psalm 51, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. If your heart is broken for sin, let it lead you to confession and repentance because that is what God favors. He loves that. He blesses that. Gentlemen, I know that's hard. That is really hard. But do we want God's blessing in our life? Richard Baxter, an old Puritan whom I've, I love, he says, Other things may be worse for breaking, yet a heart is never at its best until it is broken. Are our hearts broken because of sin? Let our hearts be broken with the things that break God's heart. Amen, gentlemen. Lastly, I want to look at God's grace and restoration. We are to walk through confession. We are to walk through repentance. Do not neglect those two areas in your life, but then also God's grace and restoration. There, there is a danger to be corrected, and, and that is this. Some believers fall under the delusion that sanctification progress in the area of sexual purity is impossible, and therefore then the pursuit of it is useless. I, I had a conversation with a gentleman like that just recently, that I cannot make progress in sexual sin, therefore I don't need to pursue it because what's the point? Gentlemen, I'll just say, restoration is possible, and Jesus is bigger than your sin problem. Do you believe that? Gentlemen, gentlemen do you believe that Jesus is bigger than your sin problem? Sure. Amen. To believe otherwise is to fall prey to Satan's lies. Uh, the reality is God's word is full of optimism for overcoming stubborn sins. And when I think about Christ, he was really hard upon hypocrites but he was really kind and gracious to sexual sinners. And he restored them. That is the nature of our Lord. I believe this can only come through the work of the Holy Spirit and humble obedience in our life. 
If we are to have victory over sexual sins, we must have his spirit working and humble obedience in our life. How do we make real progress in this area? I give you three ways. The first, remember who you are. Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If then, which can also be translated, since then, you have been raised with Christ. Do you notice that? You have been raised with Christ. Because of that, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. You have died with Christ, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. That is who we are. We are to then reckon ourselves dead unto sin. Romans 6, 11 says, so you also must consider yourself dead unto sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And gentlemen, I would also say if you're walking through or willing to walk through and are going to walk through the confession and repentance process, which isn't just a one-time thing, it happens again and again and again in our life, right? Right? and you are faithfully doing that, affirm what God says about you. You are forgiven. Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation that stands against you. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that you are a new creation in Christ. That is who you are. Secondly, I'd say be transformed by God's grace. The grace of God is not just a topic we discuss, but also a power that we receive that works in our lives. It transforms us. It doesn't just bring forgiveness, but it's transformative in its effect in our lives. That's why Titus 2.11 says, for the grace of God has appeared. It has appeared bringing salvation for all people. Notice this, training us, It teaches us to renounce ungodliness in worldly passions, to turn from sin, but then to turn to something and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. God's grace does that in our lives. Progress is possible. I have a quote. I don't know if I included it on your handout or not, but John Street wrote, when you fail to submit to the discipline of grace, you will assume that sexual purity is attained through personal effort, stubborn willpower, and dutiful performance. Have any of you guys ever tried to do that on your own? Right? It's because we're not doing it by the grace of God in his empowering in our lives. But when we learn by grace... Your heart is instructed about your sinful motivations, corrected through confession and repentance, trained through renouncing sinful habits and encouraging and encouraged in new righteous habits of life. So I'd say to you, gentlemen, if you're doing this, if you're walking through this process, affirm God's forgiveness. Don't wallow in misery. Get up and keep moving forward, right? That is what walking after Jesus looks like. Lastly, gentlemen, I'm going to finish with this. Fall in love with Jesus. He's good, is he not? Fall in love with Jesus. Keith Lambert said, the great danger in your struggle is that you will devote all of your energy to thinking true and awful things about sin, if we're talking about sexual sin, that might be pornography or lust or whatever it may be, the great danger and struggle is that we will devote all our energy into thinking true and awful things about sin and spending no time dwelling on the true and wonderful things about Jesus. Is that true? Dwell on Jesus' goodness. Paul said of that goodness, indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. He He is better than everything else. He is worth walking faithfully in this regard. Gentlemen, it doesn't escape me that We are men and are not God. We will fall again.
What do we do when we fall again? We come back to this and do it again and do it again and do it again until one day we stand with the Lord, forgiven and redeemed, completely sanctified, and we will live with Him. Our brother Don is there. That's where we're headed. Start living it now, right? I know this is hard, okay? So we're going to finish with one last song, okay? And I'm going to leave you to your table groups. The song, and I'm going to... Do I turn this off or use that one? This is a little awkward, right? <laughs> he will hold me fast. Because, gentlemen, we need him to hold us fast. Amen? Let's stand and sing that.